Hey, welcome to the Happy Ramp Podcast. I am Ted Cluck, joined as always in studio by my good friends, my partners in radio, Barnabas Piper and Ron Martin. Boys, we have a very special episode dialed up today because we have the most special fans in radio. Uh, we have the best fans in the radio business, and they have flooded our inbox with ideas, uh, episode ideas, and we're going to grind through some of those today. Uh, but before we do that, we've got a a little breaking news item, Piper. So I just ripped this one off the wire. Um, we have a, a, a special report here that T4G uh, has put out a, a bulletin indicating that this year's conference will be their last conference. They're shutting it down. Um, they're closing up shop on the, the big reformed conference game. And my question to both of you boys is... Um, why are they doing this? And is this a good thing or not? And conference, conference man, we'll start with you. Um, is this a, a moment of great sadness for you? And that you have to like cross one off the calendar? Like, this is tough. This would be like a, a favorite athlete dying for, for me and Piper. Um, what are your thoughts on this, baby? Boys, I, I appreciate that sentiment. Um, uh, you yeah, know, it's hard for you. Oddly enough, I, I've always been more of a TGC conference guy, not so much T4. Mm. Um, but nevertheless, yeah. you're, the point is taken. And, um, I, you know, it's funny because, you know, I'm thinking about Mark Dever and I'm thinking about, you know, this is this is a brother that seems to be pretty principled in, in how he operates and how he makes decisions. And I, I mean that in a positive way. And um, yeah. I, I just wonder if, you know, when we talk about celebrity pastors and we talk about how these conferences make celebrities out of pastors, and the result of that has not been good for most of these mm -hmm. most of these dudes. I w I'm just wondering, and this is just a thought. It's based on nothing other than a thought. Um, maybe Dever is somebody who's saying, "Hey, I I just don't want to contribute to that anymore, and we can do something better. We can pull back. We don't have to make the grand gesture. Um, there's other ways to um, to to get people that are gifted teachers to get their their content out. There's there's different ways for pastors and pastors' wives and ministry leaders to get together and and enjoy some of these things without it being on a scale that is so grand that it does nothing but heighten these men and women to a place that's just harmful to their spiritual health. I wonder if that's what he's thinking. Um, that yeah. was my first thought. But yeah, I love that actually. I hope I hope that is what he's thinking. And. Uh... Yeah, you guys are way more dialed into this stuff than I am, so I, I have no way of knowing if that's what he's thinking. But Piper, what's your take on this? I was, I mean, I was pretty surprised when they, so I got an email this morning <clears throat> that was saying, you know, this is the last ever, there's still time to sign up for early bird, you know, being a cynic as I can occasionally be, I was like, well, that's a very good marketing ploy. Mm. You know, nothing <laughs> sells like urgency, limited <laughs> supply. Yeah. Uh, there's clearly a limited supply of this conference. Yeah. Um, and so, but then I thought about it and I was like, well, this is, I mean, this has been going on for long what, time, like 12 or 14 yeah, years now, something like that. Yeah. I think this is like the, this is maybe the the seventh or eighth of these conferences yeah. um and so it it w what struck me was that they don't have any obvious um like th there isn't a decline that's leading them to do this mm -hmm. no obvious decline which which actually made me think that there's a there's a thoughtful strategic reason behind it there there's either like a cataclysmic problem which i'm not aware of mm -hmm. Or they're going. It's just the right time to do this. Be like you want to. You want to. You want to go out on top. You want to leave people wanting more. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they've been kind of in conscience. They primarily Dever weighing the things that Ronnie was just talking about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it. There was some irony a couple conferences ago when Mark Dever is in front of ten thousand people preaching about kind of the significance of small ministry faithfulness, not pursuing a platform. <laughs> yeah. And I ha I mean, he's brilliant mm -hmm. and he's a man of principle. I have to imagine that landed on him funny too. Yeah. That, that he's, they, that the context kind of undermines the message in some ways. 
So I wouldn't be surprised if that's it. They they also put out a video where, where Dever and Ling and Duncan were talking and basically saying when we started this, we we just wanted it to be an encouragement for pastors. That's why we just we just made it a conference. We didn't turn it into a resource center. We didn't turn it into a bunch of different training things or a website or whatever. And so I you know I thought I thought well that's there's principle in that as well. It's just they had a vision. They just they did that thing. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if some of it's also just that they're all getting older. Yeah. Every single guy involved in this outside of David Platt and Matt Chandler, who aren't involved in the planning as much as just the the preaching, are kind of looking at at the last chapter of their ministry. Mm-hmm. You know, they they're in the they're in the home stretch to retirement or they're post retirement if it's somebody like my dad or Tim Keller or some of these guys who have moved on from formal pastoral ministry. And so yeah, I think they're probably looking at it and going, well, what what do these guys do with their last few years? Yeah. As well as who are we raising up to do the next thing? Because there's kind of a gap between the 50-something, 60-something leaders and then the younger, younger guys. There's not there's no there's no big leaders in the middle right now. Here's my yeah. question. No. Do you do you wonder so typically what happens when people when people have big, you know, whether it's an event or some kind of an organization that they've kind of started and it becomes like this tradition. What usually happens is when something ends, it's because they're making way or they've made plans to create something else. Do you, do you think they actually have something else in mind that they're, that they're creating, that they're going to announce at T4G that will be sort of the, the new T4G without it being T4G? I wouldn't be at all surprised. Yeah, if it was like a hey, we're done with T4G, but we are going to do a students conference, a students conference, or they put all their efforts into the cross conference, which yeah, was right. which is really aimed at at like college students, um, aimed at missions, evangelism, things like that. And so they kind of turn their efforts to that. I wouldn't be surprised at that, but I would be very surprised if it was like. Uh, you know, a rebranding of the same thing. Yeah. Like, I think it's going to be a totally different, it's going to be church planting, it's going to be mentoring, it's going to be students. So if, if they did that, it would be next generation focused. Do you I, think it's going to be like a small, like maybe, hey, instead of just doing this one monster conference, let's do, you know, 15 more regional, smaller conferences across. You know what I mean? Like, that would no, be good for you, I don't baby. think. <laughs> I I don't think so at all. 15 more conferences. I think that, oh, too. oh my God. Let's go. <laughs> I think that's antithetical to the kind of how T4G works, which is, you know, a bunch of prominent and very busy ministry leaders running this thing. I mean, they, they, at this point, they have like a, a, a metronome like consistency in terms of how it's run, where it's run. You know, they probably signed, this is probably the last year of their lease with the Yum Center. They probably signed it, you know, 10 years ago and we're like, we'll do five of these events. And so to do that, I mean, that's an entirely different organizational structure and vision. I don't think they're going that route. That's more of a gospel coalition thing where they're just kind of constantly morphing into something else. It'll be interesting. I mean, yeah, it begs the question, where does our lease stand with the Yum Center? You know, well, we can talk about that off the air, but... uh, Well, you do do raise a very important point because we've, we've absolutely buried the lead as we are sometimes wont to do. Which is that means this will be our last. I know it, dude. Happy rant live. Yeah, this hurts our business. together for the rant. This hurts me. This will be our last together ever. for the rant. Yeah, together yeah, for exactly. the rant. The the, fina- the grand finale. You know, we'll have to we'll have to reimagine that event. You know, um, which I'm sure we can do because we're not yet in the twilight of our careers. Um, yeah, I'm not ready to hand this thing off to the next generation. I'm not either. We're in the peak earning years right now, boys, and. Um, we got to put our heads together and figure out how we're going to recoup that $250 a piece that we make off of together for the rent. Um, but that's, that's business talk. Um, Piper. Yeah. People are bored by that. We don't need to go that route. Exactly. We have uh, we have listener generated topics to get into, but before we get into them, let's do a little more business talk and let's, let's have you tell the audience about visual theology, a company with whom we are in business. I would love to tell the listeners about visual theology. Listeners, you should go check out visual theology. There it is. If you go to visualtheology.church, that's their website. 
Uh, we've, if you've been listening for any amount of time, you've heard us, you've heard us talk about them and our partnership with them. Uh, it is a, it's, it's really a full resource website for understanding scripture and understanding theology in a fresh way. And I say fresh because they're not introducing anything new. This isn't some sort of crazy messaging as much as presenting classic Orthodox Christian theology in a way that's compelling and easy to understand and clear. The two things that I want to highlight from them today, they do a bunch of stuff. They do curriculum, they do memberships, they have uh, you know, posters and apparel and different ways that you can actually like spruce up a classroom or something like that. But they have two main books, which are called Visual Theology and then Visual Theology Guide to the Bible, which are one of them takes more classic theological ideas and puts it into clear teaching and then visual aids to help you kind of picture how it works. And so, you know, a lot of times theological concepts are dense and complex and not super easy to wrap your head around, but when you can see it laid out, it's been, it's, it's really helpful. The Guide to the Bible is my favorite resource that they have because there's so much in scripture that we just read over and kind of miss the significance of until you see it laid out, whether it's you know, the genres of scripture or the promises of scripture, these different things where you see it mapped and all of a sudden it it gains gravity in your mind. So I would encourage listeners to check out those two books. So if you go to visualtheology.church slash happy, you can see uh, their special offer for our listeners. Check out those books and then use the code happy rant at checkout and you can get 20% off of any purchase. So again, happy rant at checkout, one word, happy rant, to get your uh, you get your 20% discount. I would encourage anybody to get these books just for personal study, family devotions, teaching, whatever context. They're really, really helpful. Check them out. Love it, Piper. Nicely done. Um, boys, let's get into these topics. So Piper, you put uh, a little hook in the water on Twitter um, indicating that we were recording and we needed uh, burning questions from the listenership. And the very first guy, uh, Tim Austin, shout out Tim Austin. Uh, he wanted a full review of the rise and fall of Mars Hill, which we're not going to do. Um, <laughs> we're definitely not doing that because uh, I have not listened and I'm sick of people talking about it. But I want to do one simple thing with the rise and fall of Mars Hill. I want to set an over under on total number of episodes that there's going to be. Um, well, I think... I, I can be. I, I hate to ruin your idea. I think they actually announced. Oh, big announcement! Big last media episode that they. Wow. Yeah, I, I know. That. Well, it's because you don't listen, as you just <laughs> you just staunchly, exactly. firmly declared. I think they announced that there was the episode that just dropped, and then one more. Uh, if I if I heard right, so I think they've they've kind of set a cap on it. Okay, I was going to set the over under at fifty. It'd be it'd be like if they did fifty <laughs> episodes of The Last Dance. And they're like, remember when Jordan played the Clippers on a Tuesday night in 1993? You know. Um, okay, so. I, there, there is one, there's an important piece of Rise and Fall of Mars Hill news that we haven't gotten into, which is that in the episode a couple weeks ago, I got name dropped Dude, 30 seconds into the show. That's so, big. Talk about that. Um, well, I think really what it is, is that Mike Cosper realized the, sh the show was languishing, uh -huh. really struggling, and they needed to bring some of that Happy Rant swag to bear. Yeah. Um, yeah. to gain listeners, to gain credibility. For sure. You know, people were questioning his journalistic chops yeah. and yeah. why does this Driscoll guy really matter? And so they had to bring in somebody from the Happy Rant. Heavy hitter. It just so happened that I had a friendship with one of the guys who worked at Mars Hill a few years ago. And so it was kind of a natural connection. Now, what did that do to your life, like in the aftermath of, of being mentioned on that show? Like, was it, did you just have to shut your life down for a couple of days to like respond to all the... Um, the, the inquiries and emails and all the things that were coming your way? Um, I mean, I had to mute some notifications. Really, it probably didn't do nearly as much as it did for Mike Cospo, where people were like, well, thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you for bringing in the Happy Rant yeah. influence on this show. Yeah. You, it was, you were really missing something. This is, this is it. You found it. Yeah. You, you, you know, we've been we've been griping at you all for all the stuff you're leaving out. Yeah. Now you've you've solved those problems. So um, you're welcome, Mike. Um, you're welcome to use my my likeness, my name. Really, probably true for Ted and Ronnie, wherever it fits as well. Um, we're glad to help out. And I all name, image, and likeness for sure. I mean, yeah. it's it's out there. Um, all right, so we've got a cap on the rise and fall of Mars Hill. How many episodes will that be total, Pipe? Like twelve, maybe. Here we go. Something like that. A dozen, an even dozen. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's move along to another topic. Um, 
Th- this is a guy. His name's Sean Moose. Is his real name Sean Moose? If so, that would have been a great it, like high school. Football. I know. I know a dude with the last name of Moose, and it's legit. It's legitimately. That's solid, name. dude. That's a that's a fun name. So he did one of these list things where he wants to know like what books we're reading, favorite podcasts, um, what's one thing you've been loving recently. So I'll just start with you, baby, and we can kind of whip around the room and and maybe pick one of those. Um, <laughs> I know this is so hard. All right, no, I got something. Uh, I got something. Yeah. Okay. So I just we just finished this uh, this this new um, this new series on Netflix called uh, Midnight Mass, and it was kind of okay. this spooky, kind of horror um, thing about like a, a Catholic priest that's in this really really small town, and it's mm-hmm. it's a little uh, you know uh, it's you know it, it's not really super on brand for me, but we just kind of got yeah. roped into it. It was like six or seven episodes. And it was just subtle and like I hate it when they bring in all the CGI effects and, and you know make it all like yeah. kind of cartoonish. But this thing was all yeah. it was like old school in the sense that they didn't have any of that and it was really subtle and you had no you it it, it kind of had all this uh, it had all this like religious commentary, um, a yeah. lot of scripture and a lot of like it made you really think and um, yeah. and it was just it was a perfect like October Halloween you know kind of mood setter. Um, Love. so midnight mass, we just, we just wrapped it up. It was, it was really good. I, it definitely had some, if you're somebody who gets, who gets scared really easily, I mean, there were definitely some moments that, it, you know, if you're alone in a house, it might be a little hard to go to sleep after that, but, but it was, yeah. off, it was authentic in, in how they did it. It wasn't all sort of computer generated, which I, I really dig that. So. No, I love it. I love it. That's a solid recommendation. We're always looking for like October media. Uh, media that captures kind of the the mood of the month. Baby, you should check it out. Uh, I think you and Double would would dig it. I think we would. I think we would. Yeah, we're into this thing uh, right now. It's a Danish uh, TV drama called Seaside Hotel. Mm. Uh, have we talked about this, baby? You've you talked and me? about your Danish fascination. You know your your yeah. Danish crime drama fascination. We did talk about. That. Yeah, yeah. We've moved away from the crime dramas, and this is a this is a period piece. It's sort of like. They were trying to recreate the Downton Abbey magic, but just in a in a seaside hotel setting. Got it. Uh, similar time period, so great costumes, great suits, lots of shots of the water and beaches. Uh, we're digging it. It's not as good as Downton Abbey's, but no. uh, but it's it's pretty solid. Is it is it sort of dark and gloomy? Because I feel like what a, a lot of the sort of Scandinavian yeah. TV movies, and then and then they have some brilliant like mystery novel writers, et cetera. It, there's always kind of a, there's, they're, they're kind of dark, Dude, kind of gloomy. A, and I, I like it, but here's a weird critique of it on that level. It's actually the opposite of dark in as much as they're, they're at such a high latitude, like on the map, it never gets dark there. Um, so if you've ever been to like a, a country like that, that sits on a high latitude, you know that like, especially in the summer, the days are just interminably long and it only gets dark for like three or four hours and yeah that's like i like a show yeah i like a show where like it's evening and then sometimes it's nighttime and you get a little contrast but like the sun's always out in this show um which is just interesting because of probably how and where they shot it but uh but yeah it's a a solid program i'm i'm enjoying it uh real quick book book wise uh i'm reading a book called wild and crazy guys which is about all the like SNL comedians from like the seventies yes. and the eighties. It's so that fun. That one's so fun. Oh yeah, it's a yes. blast. I'm absolutely loving it, and I'm sad that it's going to be over soon. Yeah, I I read that one. Uh, I read that one last year, maybe, and uh, I love those sort of timestamp yeah. books that that show kind of how a how an industry, especially one that that we all kind of were so familiar with. So I mean, it's yeah, it's Chevy Chase, it's Steve Martin, it's all these guys. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I loved that book. That was a ton of fun. Dude, the fun thing about a book like that is that it it like reinvigorates your movie watching life because mm. now I'm like uh-huh. I'm starting to dip my toes back into like Eddie Murphy movies and watching some of the old Bill Murray's and some of the old '80s comedies with the boys. It's been really fun. Yeah, and I was I was too young to watch a lot of those when they were released, and so yeah. I kind of missed them. You know, I came I was more like the '90s comedies with Chris Farley and Adam mm-hmm. Sandler, et cetera. So it was fun for me to start to to kind of make a list of like, oh, these are the these are the the generation of com- comedians one decade earlier who were doing the same sort of the same sort of comedy. Yeah, it's it was totally. it was a lot of fun to to get that to get that list. Pipe anything for you on this uh, this question about 
things you're enjoying lately? Um, yeah, I just finished a book called All Over But the Shoutin' by Rick Bragg, okay. which is not a new book, but I just hadn't heard about Rick Bragg recently, which until recently, which uh, feels like an oversight on my part. It's a it's it's a memoir, um, mm-hmm. and as memoirs uh, go, they either tend to be the worst books <laughs> or brilliant, yeah. and this falls into the latter category. So, grow, basically, his story of growing up really poor in the rural South, and then through the kind of you know, encouragement of a couple of teachers and, and lucky breaks becoming a writer and a journalist and traveling the world and winning a Pulitzer Prize. And then, but the, the thread is bringing kind of his constant roots to caring for his mom who never left mm. the poor rural South. Mm. And uh, so it's good. It's, it's heartbreaking and it's, he's in a fantastic writer. It's got a little bit of those hillbilly elegy vibes, yeah. except that it's not like a sociological statement. Yeah. It's just a person's story. Yeah. Um, and also the author hasn't gone completely nuts. So there's, as far as I know, dude, did the so hillbilly elegy guy well. go completely nuts? Yes. Uh, he just, he became aggressively right wing political. Oh, so okay. we're get, um, getting into this. Now. Sure, I didn't know it was going to go that way, but uh, well, yeah, I no, I, I, I didn't intend to take it that yeah, way. Yeah. I just mean like he has, cause when he wrote the book, it seemed very kind of level headed, like, yeah. Hey, here's a, here's a reality. And now he's, he's very partisan and aggressive. Interesting. Um, all right. I got another question dialed up. Uh, this one came from several people. But I'm going to attribute it to Sandy Garman because she was first with it. Shout out, Sandy. Uh, if Barnabas- Also, Sandy is one of our most regular uh, engaged listeners and social media people. So she deserves yeah, shout it. out to Absolutely. Sandy for sure. All right. Uh, her question is this. If at Barnabas Piper, at Ronnie J. Martin and Ted Cluck could do anything else career wise and be successful at it, what would they choose and why? So anything else career-wise different than what we're currently doing, uh, what we choose to do and why? I, I kind of like that one. I feel like it was thought-provoking. Uh, baby, anything come to mind for you? Yeah, I mean, I think, the, I mean, honestly, the most natural place for me would be, I, I would just, you know, I would just be a songwriter and producer. Um, mm-hmm. And I would just, that's just what I would do. And, you know, I spent so many years doing it. You know, I had times in my life where it was full-time, other times where I was kind of, doing a bivocational thing with it, but it's probably the thing that I, I, I feel most natural doing. It comes most naturally to me. I, it's, um, I I think it hits, it hits all of my personality traits and, and it's just, I think it's, it probably hits my heart in the best possible ways out of, out of anything that I do. in the fact that I, I love it. I enjoy it. I don't have to think hard about it because I'm not really an information guy. I'm more of an emotion guy. And, um, so I would, man, I would love to just be able to devote myself to that. You know, I mean, that would have been something that I think would have been my sweetest spot. God had other, obviously other plans with that. Um, but yeah, if you gave me my choice and you said, Hey, it's on the table, I, I'd probably kind of fall back into that. Mm -hmm. I'd be an NFL scout. I would want to like go on the road, um, and and like go to college campuses and scout NFL players, uh, potential NFL players. I've always wanted to do this. Um, maybe I'll maybe I'll do it yet. Maybe there's a future in that. For what me, does it but. take? What does it take to get into that? Does it help if you like used to be in the NFL? I'm I'm imagining. I mean, not a lot of NFL scouts used to be in the NFL. Some did. I mean, I think you just have to kind of hang around the the game for a while and be a coach, or you have to it helps to have been a coach on some level and. It helps to be the kind of person who can like assimilate information into like digestible statements, which is where I think the writing background would help. I think you. And it really also good. helps. Yeah, I think you just. I, I, I think it would too, that. actually, and I would enjoy doing it. And there's a there's an element of like personal connection in it where you're spending like short amounts of time with these guys and trying to ascertain whether they're the kinds of people that would that would be a fit like personality wise and background and the whole thing. So I think I would enjoy the like people side of it as well as the football side of it. And, uh, I've always wanted to give it a shot. And it's one of those things that like you, you only have one life and the Lord takes you in different directions career wise, but, uh, it would have been a, a fun baby. Way to let go, me I ask think. you this. What would it go like if you were, okay, if you were to wake up tomorrow and say, all right, I want to consider this, like what would be your yep. first move? leaning into that 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good question. Tracking down people that I know in the football business okay. and like asking about opportunities and seeing if I could get my foot in the door beyond just See, thinking about it. You know, I think I think the route to that job has changed pretty dramatically in the same way that like that that's how you used to get into being a you know a recording artist. Yeah, you know, you had to kind of find connections. Now it's essentially doing it on your own online. So yeah. there are there are a number of scouts and scouting services and recruiting services who basically just started to do that. They would just put YouTube videos up breaking down mm -hmm. players or games or you know a pitcher's mechanics. There's a guy called the Pitching Ninja mm -hmm. um, who, and it just started as like he just liked pitching and he was kind of a nerd. And now it's like he's got apparel that that major league pitchers are wearing. He's he's kind of the pitching breakdown guy yeah so i yeah i mean it, it might to get into it it might force you to do a thing that you hate which is to you know post stuff on the internet about <laughs> yeah. you know of your own work yeah so. i don't think i would do that like i would want to i would want to get into <laughs> you want to be old school i want to get it yeah i want to get into it the old school way and um no disrespect to people who have done it the other way but that's just not a way that sounds appealing to me so maybe if there if there are any nfl gms listening any executives in pro football who uh want to let me do old school scouting um you know where to find me and i would be i would be up for it piper career wise anything come to mind here on this question <clears throat> it's, a, it's a hard one for me because i you know i i before before my you know before moving into the pastorate i worked in a variety of jobs in in the professional world and i found all of them like partially satisfying and also partially kind of oppressive to my soul because I was always like, oh, there's so much that I can't do in this job. Yeah. Um, I, it's really hard to imagine doing any career that doesn't involve writing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, writing is just sort of a thing that I, that I, I love doing and I want to keep doing. Um, I love a teaching capacity mm -hmm. also teaching, coaching, those kinds of things. Um, so the thing that comes to mind is something along the lines of being a writer, but like an embedded writer. So yeah. going and coaching somewhere for a couple years to write mm. the stories of the players, you're going to find the story there. Is yeah. it, is it about the players? Is it about this team is, you know, kind of a year in the life, mm -hmm. uh, sim a little bit like what, uh, Bissinger did with Friday night lights, yeah, except that absolutely. he was just telling other people's story. Mm -hmm. I would want to be doing the job, yeah. you know? So I want to, or going and teaching for a couple years, yeah. um, at a, at a school and then, writing about it in some capacity. I I think it would be something like that, which really means that writing would be the career and then I would constantly change the field about which I was getting into. Yeah. No, I I would love that. And I think I think you'd make a killer like high school English teacher and coach. Um I could see that. Except that I would get fired because parents wouldn't like me because I would tell their kids <laughs> that they wrote dumb stuff or yeah, something. They need you know, I'd that, be like, though. this this is not English. That's not an English sentence. You can't write that. Yeah, that's true. You have to you have to just tell them they're amazing and they're all the greatest writer in the world. Um that's a that's an occupational hazard nowadays. Um all right, good stuff, boys. I've got a weird one next. And this was like this one was wrapped in another one of these like tweets that was a list like four things that he wanted us to talk about this is brandon parrot so shout out brandon parrot um one of these was he wanted us to talk about the new bond movie slash like james bond stuff in general and i touched on this because i just saw the movie with my with my family and uh it was the very first james bond movie ever that i didn't get completely bored with after 20 minutes um, and the way the bond thing works for me is I always watch the trailers and I'm always like, Oh, the suits look awesome. The cars look amazing. All these locations. I always get like seduced by the trailer. And then I go to the movie and 20 minutes in, I'm like reading football news on my phone or whatever. But this one had me the whole way, man. It was really good storytelling. Um, really good character stuff. Nice, nice character development. Um, so it was the first Bond movie I enjoyed. My question to you guys, do you care about these Bond movies at all and the whole Daniel Craig thing? Uh, does that does that move the needle for you in any way? Uh, let's start with you, Big R. Um, I literally can't even tolerate 
Bond, Bond movies on any level. Uh, they're the mo- I, mm. Basically, they made one Bond movie and they've just been remaking it. And now they're more tricky because they have like CGI and stuff. It's so predictable, mm-hmm. so boring, so many explosions. Um, I just, mm-hmm. the explosions are, I literally, I, my mind is exploding right now with all the explosions. And I just, mm-hmm. my wife loves them. So we always see yeah. them because she loves Bond. Yeah. She's watched, it's Bond. So Bond for her is like Stephen King's in terms of books. She's read every Stephen King yeah. book. She's seen every Bond film. So dude, I'm just, that's how I lay down my life for my wife, mm-hmm. man. I watch Bond wow. films and, and baby, I'm just, I'm, I'm getting some red vines. I'm eating those red vines. I'm having some popcorn. Yeah. And eventually I just fall off into a nice peaceful sleep, a nice, beautiful it's afternoon nice slumber. Experience. It's great. There so you go. Daniel, there you go. Yeah, Daniel totally. Craig to whoever else the other like 91 like Bond dudes have been. It's like they're all they're great. It's yeah. great. So, yeah, they always in the run too, where like the guy's like 65 years old and he's dating like a 25 year old. And it's always a little. I just feel like that's how uh, they start. <laughs> it's always grand. It's always well, grandpa they, dating his granddaughter. You know, it's like, dude, it is. It's that, great. that was yeah. true until that was true until Daniel Craig, because like Sean Connery was old from the time he was born. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Pierce Brosnan was. I, Roger Craig doesn't really matter. Oh, that's going to offend somebody. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that was his name, no, right? Roger. Uh, no, Roger Moore. Roger, Roger Craig, Craig was a running for the 49ers. back. 49ers. He was a running yeah, back. Yeah, say Roger yeah, Craig was yeah. a running back. It was Roger something or other. Yeah. Again, doesn't matter. That's right. the point. Um, Pierce Brosnan was sort of like, he's been sort of the like smarmy GQ middle-aged man for his entire life as yeah, well. So yeah, sure. there was kind of a creep factor. Daniel Craig is the one you look at and you're like, he he actually gives off the might be 35, might be 48, a little bit tricky to tell, but it's yeah. not it's not quite as like disgusting well, old Pike, man. That's so funny thing. you say that because I was stunned Cause I was like, I thought Daniel Craig was one of these like 59 year old dudes. And I was stunned when I looked yeah. him up a couple years ago and he was like 46 or whatever. And I was like, you're, yeah, he looks 50. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, you've got to be kid. Like this dude looks so old, you know? <laughs> I mean, he's so weathered, you know, what, you though? know? but it, yeah, he's weathered. It kind of, the whole bond thing kind of harkens back to an era though, in which like looking old and looking like an adult was aspirational. Yeah, men, you know what like, I mean? It was, like, it was pre it was pre men getting botox is, is what you're saying, babe. Dude, it was pre men getting botox. It was pre men like 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 you go to these conferences and you see these 55-year-old guys walking around in a CrossFit t-shirt and a backward ball cap and it's just like they're trying to look 15. And the Bond thing kind of like leans heavily well, into no, like look like a grown-up. It's okay. Yeah. And, you know, it's like when, when Bond is dressed casual, he's still like crisp, you know, it's yeah. like, yeah. It's, it's slacks with a crease. He's got like the perfect golf shirt on or whatever. Right. Like he never, he never does the t-shirt shorts and ball cap thing, which yeah. I, you know, like that's, I wear that. I'm so that's I'm not Tom insulting Cruise that, Mission Impossible wear thing, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, so here's the thing. Here's, here's, here's the thing that my, my feelings about Bond in general, I, I really enjoy these movies, Yeah. but they're, they are a... They're just like a package deal. It has to be exactly what it is. So all the reasons that you describe being seduced by it, yeah. Ted, you know, the the locations, the mm-hmm. the action, you know, the the song, the Bond song, all of that is is pitch perfect for what it is. Yeah. And so if you get bored by it, like, well, that's just not for you. I feel like Bond is, you know, like Five Guys Burgers. Yeah. If you change anything about Five Guys, it gets worse. Yeah. But it's not for everybody. Not everybody wants to go glut themselves on stacks of beef and, you know, fries dripping in grease. Right. But it's perfect for what it is. You know, if you're like, oh, Five Guys is going to start doing a salad bar. Right. What? No. So Bond has to stay Bond. They have to cast the right kind of person for it. The plot lines remain pretty much what they are. I mean, and they've, you know, they switched it up. There's different spy agencies or whatever, but it's, it was whatever. It's always a global conglomerate doing something dangerous to, you know, blow up satellites or something. Right. And, uh. If it stays what it is, it's tons of fun in that realm. And it's, yeah. you know, but if, but for those of you who really love like the Downton Abbey vibe, <laughs> this is, this is not Dude, that. I just, this I is just, an entirely different, this is an entirely different thing. I just can't thing. fathom another explosion, boys. Um, and here's the irony about it yeah. is that I actually like some of the Mission Impossible movies, which basically are just Bond mm. movies. They're kind of new. Yeah, but they're a little better. They're new school Bond movies, is how I would describe them. Yeah. Well, they're yeah, they're they're a little bit more like 
spy than they are action. Like Bond is a lot more, there's, there's, there's always a car and a motorcycle chase. There's always explosions. There's gadgets. And Mission Impossible is like gadgets intrigue spy a little bit more than like the shoot 'em up stuff. I mean, obviously yeah. like, I, I mean, there, it can't be any mystery that TC, and by TC, I mean Tom Cruise. That's what you call him if you know him. But, um, mm-hmm. dude, it's no mystery that, like... Or if you have a huge man crush. Yeah, I mean, for sure. So it's it's no mystery that, like, that dude was trying to start his own, like, Bond-ish-esque franchise. Right. Because he's not going to do it forever, but I guarantee you that thing's going to continue with, like, a new dude when Tom Cruise turns, like, 75 in, like, two years, you know? He's going to try and do it forever, for sure. Oh, 100%. Um, well, I think... This is Daniel Craig's last Bond movie, yeah. su- supposedly. So he is going the way of of Mark Dever. He's following in Mark Dever's footsteps and riding. These two guys are so sunset, alike. Yeah, yeah, going yeah. out on top. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to imagine two more similar. In my mind, I've always conflated the two. Actually, yeah. sometimes when I think about Bond, I just see Mark Dever <laughs> running around, you know, <laughs> hanging off a helicopter. <laughs> yeah. Always, always dressed crisply. Always dressed crisply. Yeah, absolutely. Rug, rugged, ruggedly handsome. Oh, absolutely. I so ruggedly handsome. But so, yeah, what we get into now, though, is the fun of who is going to be cast as the next Bond, which I'm yeah. sure a listener will suggest. Yeah. And it will be a worthless conversation because neither of you guys care at all. No, I actually care about talking to... about I, I wouldn't mind talking about that. I like that. I just don't want to have to watch him. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Got you. Yeah. We'll save that. We'll, we'll save that for another boys time. This. Would it be uh, okay? Go. Because I'm not invested in this, so I'm not. I'm not even giving an opinion. It's just a. It's an honest question. Would it ever yeah. help if they got someone? If they tried to get someone a little funnier, I think it would help. You know, could they yeah. get somebody with a little bit of a twist of humor to where it's like he's still mm-hmm. debonair, he's still rugged, he still gets all the mm-hmm. ladies, he still he still somehow manages to survive all the explosions, he jumps from the helicopters, the whole thing. But like, there's kind of that wink and nod aspect to him to where he's actually has has a little bit of humor. Yeah. Like, how would that? I yeah. that might actually draw me in a little bit. I'm not lying. Well, I'm that's, not gonna lie. That that's partially an actor thing. Like Daniel Craig doesn't really do funny, right? But but also, that's a writing thing. Like the script is what is what makes that in a lot of ways. And these movies are just like they're so center cut. They're very earnest action. Yeah, yeah, very like earnest. intensely intensely focused action. Now, of course, if they cast, I don't know who would fit that bill. I don't know, like somebody like a Chris Pine or somebody who has a little bit of that, like. They they can do a little or like he's too old. They can do now. a little bit of the humor, but like mid career John Cusack. Hmm. Like, uh, he's not good looking enough. Mm. No, you're right. But like Gross Point Blank era Cusack would would be the guy with like to, a little humor. It's hard to find a guy who can do a little bit of humor and be intimidating. Like and be hot. The, like hot people aren't yes. funny. Like hot people haven't had to develop the i don't know man i pr- i you know i know we said we weren't going to get into this but i'm just yeah. going to leave the chris hemsworth idea out there i know he's australian oh, dude, but, but like just... what's an australian but just a redneck brit and uh it's just too handsome like, man we'll just... i mean it's just uh, what about a what about like a yeah. middle-aged overweight dude what about vince <laughs> vince vaughn man vince vaughn, vaughn. Dude, i would <laughs> like i would love to see that guy drop vince 25 vaughn. pounds for the role and just is aren't we just releasing yeah. johnny english three at that point <laughs> like it's just it's a it's the knockoff of bond dude Isn't i would that I would love that actually. I, mean, I would watch the H out of that or the Hemsworth one. To be honest, I, I actually love that idea too. But like, what would what would uh, Vince Vaughn like James Bond look like? Like tur- he'd be doing the turbo like fast talking thing. He'd be doing the turbo and, uh, fast talking thing. He'd have to drop yeah. twenty five pounds, and it would just be yeah. to him to have that sort of that the <laughs> just sort of that. That, that style of humor he had. You know, him like jumping from the helicopter and then looking straight into the camera and making one of his oh, puns. I, I mean, that would be dude. epic. I would love it. I've got a take on Vince Vaughn. Like, late career Vince Vaughn that's going to sound like like a shot. Are we but... kind of at post-career Vince Vaughn at this point? <laughs> that's exactly. That's probably more accurate. I think he's kind of morphing into Rodney Dangerfield. Wow. If that name means anything to you guys from the 80s. Wow. I think he's kind of becoming Dangerfield, and I like it. I, you know I'm, what's, I'm here for You know that. what's weird, baby, is I, I, I know yeah. exactly what you're saying. Here's what's disappointing yeah. to me about Vaughn is they oh. keep trying to put him in some more serious stuff, like that, like mm. whatever that Hack Ridge or whatever that thing was. Yeah. And I, yeah. I just, I'll, <laughs> all I want him to do is make the same movie every time talking the way Oh, me does. too. Like, I don't want it to yeah. be... That's all I want him to do. 
Is, Make an 88 minute version of like swingers on a boat, swingers on an island, swingers just be, anywhere. Just be and I'm Vince Vaughn. That's all you got. That's exactly. all anybody just wants you to do. He's, he's comedy Tom Cruise. Basically. Dude. In that, like, he, he, there's, he only does he only one can thing, do but if one you thing put well. him in the right yeah. things, it's, it's great. great. Yeah. You know what he actually needs? He needs an interview show. Mm. Like, not a late night show where you have to be a big sweetheart and like hit all the social issues. Like, not that, but like, he just needs a like a Netflix interview show where he sits down with various people from different walks of life and like vamps. Dude, that would be sweet. Um, and I and it brings up the uh, the point, Big T, about like, dude, yeah. what has what what happened with with Double V, man? Like, what? Like, he really no, dude. He, he kind of dropped. I know he had a family. I know he has kids now, but like, he really dropped yeah. off. Yeah, I bought so much Vince Vaughn stock after Swingers. Like I thought he would be a huge movie star, and he kind of was. I mean, you know, he's done big stuff. Yeah, he was he's done huge stuff. Yeah, he did Wedding Crashers was probably his like apex. Mountain, the breakup but... was huge with yeah the Dodge breakup ball. dodgeball was Dodge massive. Ball. Yeah, all that. Yeah, he ripped off a nice little run of comedies there, and he had some good kind of in there after. with Ben Stiller too. Kind of that weird, yeah. kinda a little bit of that gross yeah. out, you know, comedy. Kinda. I don't think he like he didn't make the next step into like writing and producing, even though he claimed to be a producer in Swingers. Um, he never, he never kind of took that like writing producing thing. I feel like something I, see, happened. I think him. something happened that I feel like we're missing. I think so. Maybe he got like quietly canceled. Who knows? But like, I, I think Vince Vaughn would be prime for like a bunch, a whole bunch of dad roles now. You know what I mean? Like he shows up as the dad and like yeah. some drama or some like depressing Jeff Daniels thing, or, you know, like he just shows up. And he's the I feel right like age. He would work well in like a Coen Brothers movie, like him and yeah. like a, a a remade Raising Arizona yeah, or something. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I could see it. I, I could totally see it. Um, I, this needs to happen. We need we need late career Vince Vaughn to have a a, a heyday, and uh, I would I would love it. Uh, boys, I'm looking at I'm looking at his IMDb, and like all of his recent movies, well, not all of them, but the vast majority are like p- pretty serious or That's horror. What I'm or dark. Yeah. Yeah. He, it's like, it's like he tried so hard to shed the comedy thing that he's like, well, what will make people vomit? Yeah. Perfect. Let's do those movies. Yeah, he's kind of taken a pivot into like the B movie horror thing, which is, is weird. He's in these like low budget slasher movies that are in the theater for like 20 minutes. Yeah, he needs to take advantage um, of like Netflix and everything that offers actors yeah. in terms of variety. And he should just be doing more stuff. I I just don't know why he's as inactive as he is. I guess is what I'm trying to. He yeah. he also just needs to like call up Owen Wilson once every two months and go. Well, what are we doing now? Totally. Because Owen Wilson and Vince Vaughn pair so. It was well a classic together. Hollywood comedy pair. There's no doubt about it. Dude, if those two guys had a podcast together, I would quit my job <laughs> to listen to it all day long. Um, same, same with Ben Stiller. Vince Vaughn and Ben yeah. Stiller could do. Yeah, the Stiller kind of dropped off too. Also, Stiller has actually gotten into the like directing, acting, producing side of things. Like he's yeah. he's a behind the camera guy now. They're all middle aged white guys. Why don't they have podcasts? Like, <laughs> this is crazy to me. Probably because like, they got canceled. It's by too Hollywood. low brow, like, man. Podcasts are of. too low brow for them, man. Vince Vaughn having a podcast seems like uh, just the lowest of low hanging fruit. I would listen all day long. Uh, all right, we're we're getting low on time, boys. We got time for one more quick one. I thought this one was intriguing. This might be the last great one on the list. Uh, this is from Mike McGarry. Shout out Mike McGarry. Who's the most surprising person to reach out and let you know that they're a fan of the rant? So we can go rapid fire on this one. Who's the most surprising person mm. to reach out and let you know that they're a fan of the rant? Well, dude. Um, I'll, I'll go. I'll go. Uh, I, I was on a podcast um, a week or two ago with a lady who is a she and her husband co-pastor a church together and she expressed her adoration so they're and they're not you know they're they're not explode they're not really reformed mm-hmm. and what surprised me was that that she loved the podcast where we are pretty we're pretty explicitly reformed mm-hmm. and uh it, it just I'm not used to people liking something from a you know, kind of a camp that is outside of their own yeah. and one that by, by reputation is pretty antagonistic. Like our camp, yeah. not real friendly towards those who are different than us. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was, it was the, it was the great sort of surprise. Cause I was like, Oh, we must be, we must be representing something fresh and new and not complete jerkishness. Yeah. So, 
Uh, I was I was really surprised by that in a in a great way, and that's not the first time that's happened. It's just the most recent one. Nice baby. Um, what about you, Big R? You know, it's weird. I can't. There, there's a couple that are right on the tip, and I they I can't think of them. But I will say this, man. It's always funny to me mm. when I'll I'll sit down. It'll be with like I, yeah, just like what, what Pipes describing, like it, whether it's a podcast or another pastor. And there's kind of this thing where you can tell they're being a little quiet. And the, you, yeah. you get the sense they're wanting to like ask you things that they're that they're too you know they feel a little like hesitant, and then inevitably mm-hmm. at some point I get like this right before I'm walking out the door they lean in and they go hey just so you know I'm a huge fan of the rant, and I go and it's <laughs> like it's like well dude like you could have mentioned this two hours it's not two shameful hours ago. yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, you could like you didn't have that. to pull me like into the bathroom and like turn off all the lights and like <laughs> whisper it in my ear. Like it's like, yeah. dude, it's cool. Like you know, like, I do the podcast, so like it's it's cool. Yeah, yeah. And um, so that That's that happens fun. so often. And and like what Pipe said, it's usually with somebody that I would go, oh, he, um, he wouldn't know if he even knew what we were. There's no way in like 17 lifetimes he would ever listen to this thing. You know? Yeah. Yeah, it's surprising. You know what surprised me a little bit yesterday, boys, was the fact that uh, so we had this we had the marketing meeting with our book publisher, and uh, there were like twenty five people on the Zoom call. And like all kidding aside, I feel like they did a good job. They did a great job. Um, yeah. So that was yeah, that was that was fun. Uh, but I also caught like a vibe that like maybe they listened to the show because um, mm. I think until that point we had been resolute in believing that like not one person had listened to like one minute of our program. <laughs> uh, but there there was something about the meeting yesterday that like kind of threw me the vibe that maybe they listened from time to time, which uh, I don't know, warmed my heart. It made me feel excited to be in the book business with them. Um, what were your thoughts on that? Did you did you also catch that vibe or am I making that I up? I kind of did because when we did a yeah. little bit of our sort of like when we did a little bit of our banter just to kind of to kind of yeah. add some energy to the meeting. Um, they, yeah, which it desperately needed. By yeah, the way. for sure. But they all they all got a kick out of it. Like they, it's <laughs> yes. they, they had familiar, happy, you know, familiar happy comical, associations. So, yeah, yeah, looks on their face. So yeah, yeah I don't know. Yeah, you yeah. Know and I've, I mean, having having been on the publishing side of marketing things, you know, where somebody brings a project to the table. In this case, like imagine our our good buddy Kyle bringing a project to Harvest House and saying, "Hey, there's these guys. They do this podcast. It's this kind of unique thing." Yeah, uh, we should totally do a book. And in most publishing cases, people do not try to understand the vibe. Yeah, they just yeah. you know, or maybe they'll go listen to like one or two things and kind of be like, "Ah, uh, maybe I kind of get it." <clears throat> uh huh. And so, you know, like when I worked at I worked at Moody Publishers and brought in a few authors who were in like the Christian hip hop scene, and mm-hmm. like that doesn't. <laughs> Yeah, you know, whatever. Twelve years ago, that wasn't a thing that that yeah. you know your average fifty five year old white person would right. have any familiarity with, or knew how to interact with, or anything, and and no effort to try. And yeah. so it was. I required total evangelism on my part to push this thing mm-hmm. through. I didn't get that vibe at all. It felt like they were, uh, if not fans, they were at least like, okay, we get it. Like we get what you're trying to do. Um, in their efforts to put together marketing copy, you know, it, they, they were trying to make it fit the the vibe yeah. of the show. Yeah. And yeah, so it, it was, it was a very different thing than what it, than an instance where you just have like the one advocate who's like, no guys for real, it's going to be good. I swear. Yeah, I promise yeah. it'll, it'll work. It'll work. Yeah. I, I had always thought this was a one advocate pro, uh, project, but, uh, but yeah, yesterday gave me some, some hope that maybe we have a few more advocates there at the, at the publisher. So uh, boys, I got to go teach school. Uh, I got to run. So this has been fun. Shout out again to our listeners, the best listeners in radio, for a great list of things for us to talk about. We may have enough meat left on the bone that we could get another app out of out of that list. I'll have to take a oh, look yeah. again. Li- listeners came in hot with the questions. So they I did. think we've got a bunch more. They did a fantastic job. And boys, we did a fantastic job doing what we always do in this program, which is wandering to and fro throughout some listener-submitted topics. And until next time. The Happy Rant is brought to you by Resonate Recordings. If you go to ResonateRecordings.com, you can see the full range of services they offer. So if you're considering starting a podcast, they are the ones we recommend going with. Again, go to ResonateRecordings.com to see their prices, to connect with them and ask any questions, and to see what they can do to help you launch, edit, master, and improve your podcast. 
Again, go to ResonateRecordings.com to see what they can do to help you launch and improve your podcast.